John, thank you very much. It really is a pleasure for me to uh, be here uh, in Miami. Uh, sadly, I'm here for a pretty short period of time, uh, and I'm actually due to be on a plane in a couple of hours' time, so I'm actually going to have to leave before uh, the end of the session. Uh, you might wonder why it is that, uh, you know, coming from Edinburgh, I'd want to rush away from the warmth of Miami to the cold of Edinburgh, uh, but actually, surprisingly, we have yet to see any snow uh, in Edinburgh uh, this year. So. Uh, my remit really is, is then just to uh, give you a flavour of what uh, we have been doing in the last couple of years uh, around the topic of enhanced recovery after liver surgery. And I'm sure as you're aware, you know, there have been many advances in uh, liver surgery. A lot of the focus has been on the uh, selection of patients uh, for resection uh, and the actual resection uh, techniques uh, themselves. Uh, there are challenges uh, in liver surgery. Uh, you know, here this is a kind of typical Scottish uh, patient. You know, he's eaten all the pies, uh, uh, and I, you know either he is, uh, can cause problems uh, with his liver function. But of course, now, uh, particularly in the area of managing colorectal liver metastasis, uh, chemotherapy uh, also uh, challenges us. Uh, uh, but what I want to focus on is uh, is this topic of enhanced uh, recovery, uh, and. Uh, I know that the, the principles of this are going to be covered, but for the purposes of my talk, just wanted to highlight the fact that this is actually about the uh, optimization uh, of patients before surgery. Uh, it's about uh, trying to avoid uh, complications or problems uh, that might prolong the patient's stay. It's trying to minimize the stress response uh, to surgery. Uh, and speeding recovery uh, and uh, returning the patient to normal uh, function. So uh, early recognition of abnormal recovery and appropriate intervention is key uh, in all of this. Uh, in the area of liver surgery, what we're uh, uh, wanting to establish is if it's safe, uh, can we actually uh, impact on hospital stay? This is not just about throwing the patient out uh, into the community early and free up a hospital bed. Uh, it, it's about uh, enhancing the recovery uh, and uh, what evidence is there in the area of uh, open liver surgery and, and what of the various elements are, are important uh, within an enhanced recovery program. Um, I will touch on the issue of laparoscopic liver resectional surgery but most of my comments are going to be about open surgery and I would obviously acknowledge uh, that uh, our group as many other groups have found laparoscopic surgery as being feasible and safe. It does have definite advantages uh, in recovery, but of course it's, it's not, it does not have general application uh, across uh, the board uh, for the patient population that we uh, manage. So um, uh, our interest in this has actually been fueled by uh, colleagues uh, in our colorectal um, group uh, who for a couple of years have been running an enhanced recovery program in patients uh, after colonic resections. But what we did was we collaborated with one of our former uh, fellows uh, who's based in Maastricht in the Netherlands uh, and the enhanced recovery after surgery group uh, in Europe uh, to focus specifically uh, on uh, a multimodal enhanced recovery program in patients undergoing open liver resection. And this was work that was published a few years ago in the British Journal of Surgery. But our hypothesis was that goal-directed fast-track uh, uh, surgery, uh, uh, fast-track program, uh, which optimised perioperative care, actually reduces uh, uh, hospital stay. Uh, so I've got an extra reduce in there, but it reduces or accelerates, sorry, it accelerates recovery, reduces hospital stay, and shortens uh, hospital stay. That's interesting. I seem to have got. Uh, uh, three objectives there, they're all pretty much the same. Um, the program uh, is uh, about uh, 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 enhancing all elements of care. It's about uh, same day admission, uh, uh, preoperative optimization, uh, oral carbohydrate loading uh, up to two hours prior to anesthesia, um, laxation with uh, magnesium hydroxide and osmotic purgative, um, using thorac thoracic epidural and short-acting anaesthetic agents, um, uh, minimizing intervention, so no nasogastric tube, uh, no intra-abdominal drain, uh, having the patient after surgery in the recovery area 
uh, or the surgical high dependency area uh, before transfer to the general floor or ward. Commencing fluids and diet uh, and mobilising the patient on the day of surgery, setting them daily goals uh, and milestones uh, and uh, working to agreed specific discharge criteria. Uh, it's important in any enhanced recovery after liver surgery program to ensure that all key staff are involved. For the purposes of our uh, uh, early work, we had a specific research coordinator. Uh, it, it clearly helps if you have a nurse coordinator to support uh, the, the patients going through the program. Uh, patients are actually informed uh, regarding the protocol uh, at a pre-admission counselling uh, session and the importance of early mobilisation and oral intake as explained to the patient. Uh, patients were discharged only if they met the discharge criteria uh, and if follow-up within three days was possible if there was an issue or a problem. Uh, it's important that patients uh, have access uh, to the team Patients were actually given the mobile telephone number of the operating consultant surgeon, but I'll actually have to say that that was only in Maastricht in the Netherlands. In Scotland, we would never actually want to do that. Uh, but the key thing, obviously, is for the patient to know that they've got direct access to the unit, that there's direct communication so that the protocol can be safely deployed. So just kind of focusing then on the outcomes. In this particular study, this was a comparative study, not a randomized control trial, between a control group of 100 patients who'd undergone liver resection by conventional means. So it is, to a certain extent, a historical control group. And comparing this against 61 patients who went through our enhanced recovery uh, after surgery program, you'll see that in both groups, uh, epidural analgesia was... Uh, was uh, uh, the preferred uh, approach, uh, although not every patient uh, had epidural uh, analgesia successfully deployed. Uh, one of our patients in the ERAS program did have an abdominal drain, uh, uh, but uh, otherwise the protocol was, uh, was adhered to. The complication rate was pretty similar in both groups. Uh, there were two patients in the control group uh, who died within 30 days of surgery. Uh, importantly, uh, you'll see that the readmission rate uh, was, was, was similar at about 10-13% uh, uh, after liver surgery um, and that what we uh, uh, observed was that the total length of hospital stay uh, was significantly reduced from uh, the norm of 8 uh, to 6 days. If we actually looked at other markers of recovery, 92% uh, of patients had resumed oral intake within 4 hours of surgery. Uh, normal diet uh, resumed by day one. Uh, two patients in the ERAS program did have a problem with gastric stasis, which required a temporary placement of a nasogastric tube. Uh, but 85% of patients were fully mobile by day three. And this is actually one of the paradoxes of the program, is that if you are using epidural analgesia, the tradition certainly in the United Kingdom is that the patients are nursed in a high dependency environment and that their mobility is restricted uh, by that. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but you'll see that 48% of patients were discharged within uh, five days in the ERALS group uh, and that there was a significant reduction overall uh, in hospital stay. So, uh, on the basis of this comparative study, we deduced that multimodal enhanced recovery program for patients undergoing liver resection for primary and secondary liver tumours but with otherwise normal hepatic function is feasible and effective. Patients did mobilise early uh, and there was a 25% reduction in hospital stay with no associated increase uh, in readmission rate. Um, only half of the patients, though, clearly were discharged within five days, uh, and, and we saw that as being an area uh, where there was room for improvement. Uh, but what we learned uh, from this uh, pilot project was that such a program does clearly need uh, patient involvement and close uh, supervision uh, and enforcement. Um, now, I know I was asked to speak about the UK experience, but I couldn't help but just refer back to a publication that came out in HPB a couple of years ago, uh, from Case de Jong's uh, group in Maastricht, where they undertook a comparative study between two small groups of patients uh, who had undergone laparoscopic liver resectional uh, surgery um, and uh, uh, drew the comparison between 
outcome for those patients that were with, managed within an ERAS programme uh, and those that were managed uh, traditionally. Uh, and, and just to uh, summarise that, um, uh, they uh, actually uh, had, there were differences between the groups in terms of reduced blood loss and reduced operating time, which doesn't quite chime necessarily well with enhanced recovery. Um, uh, that, I think, Seton is, is down more to operative uh, technique. Uh, but within this uh, multimodal program, they did see an improved functional recovery uh, in these patients. Uh, and again, uh, a reduction in uh, length of stay. So there's no reason why the, the enhanced recovery um, principles cannot uh, be uh, uh, delivered uh, uh, in a laparoscopic liver resectional program as well. I want to come back to this issue of uh, ep epidural uh, in that uh, in our uh, practice, uh, uh, particularly in the patients undergoing liver resection, uh, th there are the general considerations of safety around uh, epidural. Uh, our, anesthetic, our anesthetic program is very pro-epidural, uh, uh, but in this group who may also uh, post-resection have problems with coagulopathy, uh, you know, there are sometimes slight anxieties about the potential for morbidity from an epidural catheter. There is the issue about how reliable uh, these are, and we certainly have observed uh, in uh, some of our um, uh, activity that um, delivering the epidural effectively has been a problem. Uh, and uh, there are also potential uh, side effects uh, in our practice. There is this reduction, reduction in mobility in the first couple of days when the patient is nursed in a high dependency environment. Uh, there always seems to be this issue around epidural related hypotension. And no matter how carefully we try to uh, monitor this uh, and avoid over-enthusiastic resuscitation of the patient, we have observed in our practice that that is normally associated with over-administration of uh, fluids uh, in the post-operative uh, period and a degree of fluid retention uh, in these patients. So uh, one of the nice things about an enhanced recovery after uh, surgery program is that you can target a specific um, uh, intervention. And what we were interested uh, in was to see whether we could replace uh, epidural analgesia uh, with uh, a wound analgesia uh, system. Uh, I'm having problems obviously with my Scots and I've got wound wound analgesia on my slide. Uh, but the, uh, this, this is, a, is a system uh, which can be easily deployed or, or placed at the time of abdominal wound closure. It doesn't uh, involve the long delay that sometimes occurs whilst you're waiting for the patient to come into the operating room uh, after placement of the epidural. Uh, the surgeon is actually in control uh, of the analgesia uh, delivery. And so the study that we undertook was uh, one, again, which was published in HPB um, uh, a year or so ago. We called it the liver study. Uh, we like the an acronym, so here is the local infiltration versus epidural on recovery study. Uh, and the hypothesis for this study uh, was that wound catheter as part of a multimodal analgesic regimen is an acceptable alternative to epidural uh, in liver resection patients. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, all, all of the detail, but just focus uh, for the sake of, of time and expediency on the outcomes. And if we look at the, the, the recovery in the high dependency area uh, after uh, surgery, uh, you'll see that for those patients who had a wound catheter uh, with a patient-controlled analgesia device, then uh, the discharge criteria from the high dependency unit was met uh, uh, much more quickly uh, than with uh, epidural. Uh, what's actually quite interesting is that when you actually looked at the actual discharge, uh, there's always pressure on high dependency beds and some patients with the epidural seem to actually be discharged a little bit more quickly uh, than they should have uh, done uh, based upon the, the criteria. Uh, but there was still a significant difference uh, in stay in the high dependency unit. I mean, our primary outcome was to look at uh, discharge uh, from hospital and again looking at when the patients met the discharge criteria. And you'll see that with this wound catheter system, uh, there was a significant advantage, 4.5 uh, days uh, as opposed to 6.25 days for the epidural. Uh, uh, on this occasion, you'll see that the actual discharge was a little bit slower for the wound catheter and PCA system because often there are social issues that uh, may uh, require the patient to stay in hospital uh, in the Scottish system uh, for an extra day or so. 
Uh, so within this randomised study, uh, we found that both epidural and local uh, anaesthetic wound catheter systems provided very effective uh, analgesia following open uh, liver resection. Uh, the pain scores were slightly lower in the epidural group, uh, but not uh, significantly so. Uh, but what we saw was that uh, these patients were actually wired up to uh, assess their mobility, and we, did, and we uh, 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 found out that the mobility was greater in the wound catheter group, which is kind of what you would expect when traditionally the epidural seems to uh, have the staff restrict the patient's movement. Um, we saw no significant difference in the length of time to reaching criteria for discharge uh, from uh, hospital, uh, but the uh, wound catheter uh, uh, seemed to allow a shorter stay in the high dependency unit. Uh, there has been a, a recent systematic review uh, in HPB undertaken by Spelt and his colleagues which has looked at, at, at both hepatic and pancreatic resections. I, I would commend it to you, it's such a good article, uh, but what it uh, basically demonstrates or concludes is, is what we feel about these enhanced recovery programs that fast-track rehabilitation for liver and pancreatic surgical patients is certainly feasible. Uh, and that we have an opportunity within these programs uh, to focus on optimizing individual elements of the fast track program. And we have got ongoing uh, uh, prospective clinical trials looking at the analgesia elements of these uh, programs. So I've given you a snapshot uh, of our uh, enhanced recovery after uh, liver surgery program uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, again, I am rather sad that I'm going to have to uh, trudge through the snow in the northern reaches of, uh, of the states to get back uh, to Edinburgh. Uh, but again, thank you very much for the opportunity of allowing me to talk to you today. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Wanted to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me over to share some of our experiences, but also give you some background of the physiology and the pharmacology and the rationale of using enhanced recovery programs, um, especially in relation to liver resections. I have no financial um, conflicts of interest here. And again, these are the objectives. What I hope to do is uh, uh, go take you through the um, perioperative issues of conventional surgical care. What have we been doing so far and why it's not working in terms of functional recovery of the patients? Um, discuss some of the key components of the ERAS programs and as always, what can we do together as a perioperative team to look at some of the um, uh, areas where we need to work together uh, for some collaborative research opportunities. So the whole goal of enhanced recovery after surgery is this, to make the recovery of the patients a little easier. It's patient-centered. So what's post-operative recovery is a big question then. It's not an all or none phenomenon. It starts in the early post-operative period, which is when the patient comes out of the operating room to the PACU. The intermediate phase, when they get discharged from the PACU, go on to the hospital floor and get discharged from the hospital. And then it's the late recovery phase. How do they actually do when they're discharged from the hospital? And by the time they get back to their daily activities or work or whatever that may be. So how can we make a difference? That's the big question. And the answer is we need a different approach. And the approach is to rethink our current conventional perioperative surgical care pathways and practice. And it's very clear that our traditional care models, the way we've been working, are not conducive for rapid recovery. And why is that? And this is the surgical audience, so I don't need to explain to you all the responses after a magical surgical incision and the temporal relationship of the inflammatory cascade, the cytokine response, and the sympathroadrenal response from a major surgery. So this is our goal. Even if you look at the inflammatory response or the energy expenditure, there is an initial onset of the inflammatory response to incision, which is needed for wound healing. But we hope that there is a timely resolution of the inflammatory response for rapid recovery. And actually, the energy expenditure and the metabolic catabolism mirrors that. The goal is for a rapid recovery. 
So with that in mind, let's see what our conventional practices have been, starting from the preoperative phase, going through the intraoperative and the postoperative phase. In the preoperative phase, we've been doing bowel preps and fasting. So as we know, the liver glycogen stores get depleted within 24 hours. And after that, there is an insulin resistance effect that comes on. And then we ask our patients not to eat anything or to drink or eat after midnight, and typically patients stop doing that at seven o'clock the night before. So they come for surgery in a volume depleted state. Intraop, we, anesthesiologists, have traditionally been using formula-based intraoperative fluid therapy. No doubt in my mind, we've been giving the patients too much fluids. And that has both immediate and long-term effects. And you guys have been complaining for a long time. But once a patient gets discharged from the PACU, typically most anesthesiologists don't follow. So we don't have a clue as to how your patients are doing on the floors, whereas you guys have to deal with it. Ileus, um, cardiopulmonary compromise, some of you resort to routine diuretic therapy on day one or day two or day three to get all the fluid out, dilutional anemia, transfusions, and the rest. Traditionally, we've also been focusing our perioperative pain management strategies based on opioids. We had a discussion last year. We had a session that we just came back from. And even here, there was some discussion about wound catheters and epidurals and the side effects of epidurals. While there are all good questions and real concerns, the key is how do we manage these patients through an opioid sparing strategy? We've been traditionally using static measures for hemodynamic monitoring and interventions. CVP and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, as we've heard in the earlier session, are worthless. It's as good as flipping a coin. So we have to move away from static measures and go at some dynamic measures of hemodynamic parameters and indices. It's still evolving. We don't have all the answers yet. What about in the post-operative fees? We've been continuing the same. All patients get 150 mils per hour of D5 normal saline, or whatever your formula may be. And we have to ask the patient not to get out of the bed. Typically, patients get NG tubes, whether they need them or not, and sometimes some drains. And we ask them not to eat or drink till they pass gas. And we leave it epidural for long periods of time. When we have shown, or it's well known, that Probably after post-op day three, with a well-managed program, there's not that much benefit. Your maximum bang for the buck with an epidural or any regional block is in the first three days. And then we leave urinary catheters till the epidural comes up. So what we have been doing is prolonging the functional recovery. We've been putting the patients in the hospital. And then the patient component. The patient comes to the hospital thinking that they're going to have a big procedure, they're going to stay in the hospital till we tell them to go home, and then there are other social, logistic, post-discharge care issues. So we haven't been helping. And this quote from Kehlet was a challenge to our surgical colleagues, but it's a challenge to all of us together as a team. And he's challenged the traditional way of doing stuff, but more importantly, there's so much variation within our own individual practices. Even if you take uh, our own practice of three liver surgeons currently, there is a variation in how each one of them manages their patient's post-op. So what we can do to help our patient care and functional recovery is to standardize care, minimize variation, come together as a group and see what we agree upon and what we need to study further so we come up with a pathway a clinical pathway, and that's going to be the answer. And we have to think beyond what we've been doing and just push the envelope. So how do we go about doing this? And you're all scientifically minded people, just like our group, we want to look at evidence-based. But unfortunately, there's not much evidence out there for everything we want to do. So we have to create evidence-informed approach to perioperative care to improve our patient's functional recovery. And it's unlikely that any single intervention is going to make that difference. So we need a comprehensive perioperative approach, which is evidence-driven, evidence-informative, 
but more importantly is pathway-based, minimize variation, standardize care. So enhanced recovery after surgery is just one of those initiatives which started across the pond. They have much more experience than we in the North America on how to push that envelope further by incorporating what I've just mentioned. So the key is patient optimization. We've heard about that from Professor Garden. Surgical stress reduction promotion of patient return to normal function. But most importantly, it's patient engagement and empowerment. And by doing so, we improve outcomes. If we improve outcomes and focus on functional recovery, the advantage of that is going to be reduced length of stay. So our focus is not reduced length of stay. Our focus is to improve functional recovery. And by doing so, we're going to reduce length of stay and gain all the other benefits of a reduced length of stay, which is the cost. So it's a comprehensive program. It includes preoperative elements, intraoperative elements, and postoperative elements. So I'm just going to take a few minutes, go over some of the key components of each of these elements. Most importantly, is, again, I cannot emphasize this enough. It's patient education. The patient has to be given goal-directed progression of care to discharge and recovery. And all of us know that no matter how many times you tell them, they're not going to register. So they need an oral as well as a written care plan. We have to agree upon a preset discharge criteria. And we have to identify what are the barriers for discharge of this patient. Not only from hospital, but what are the barriers for functional recovery after discharge from hospital and come together to see if we can discuss and address some of them at your office visit. So we know which patient is going to do well. And we have to also focus on early scheduled follow-up and have a plan for readmission. So again, the key is not reduced length of stay, kicking them out of the hospital, but the key is functional recovery, taking care of them, and putting steps and systems in place for that process. Best physiological condition as possible. That includes nutrition and anemia optimization. No bowel prep and patients can have clear fluids. I want to take a minute or two of anemia optimization. The single most important risk factor for blood transfusions in the perioperative period after estimated blood loss during surgery is preoperative anemia. So when you're working with cancer patients, and if they've had neoadjuvant therapy, you have a typically four to six week time frame from the time they finish the neoadjuvant therapy to the time you schedule them for your surgery. So we have that time frame to optimize their preoperative anemia status, and it's going to go a long way in minimizing the transfusion rates and requirements. And there is enough literature that by preoperative nutritional optimization and physiological conditioning, we're going to help the patient endure the perioperative stress response in a much better way and get them back to their functional status. What we do in our practice is to focus on opioid sparing multimodal strategies. So we give the patients preoperative meds in the holding area, which includes estaminophen, Tylenol, Tramadol extended release, which is a mu agonist, but it also has other pharmacological actions which help with persistent post-surgical pain and minimizing opioid requirements. We use pregabalin and COX-2 inhibitors. So again, all of this are given before the incision is made in the holding area to help with minimizing the inflammatory response to incision and to opioid sparing strategies. Intraoperative, we have to use goal-directed fluid therapy. We already talked about that. And we have to have a plan for procedure-specific pain management. Epidural is not the panacea, although I'm a strong proponent of that. There are certain patients who would benefit from other modalities of pain management strategies. So we have to have a procedure-specific pain management plan. Again, the key is we come down to this, multimodal opioid sparing strategies. And then the anesthesia team can help 
this with various other things like maintaining normal thermia, euglycemia, lung protective ventilatory strategies using short acting anesthetics and adequate reversal of muscle re uh, relaxants at the end. There is enough literature about goal-directed therapy and the immediate benefits of goal-directed therapy in the perioperative surgical care. But what is interesting is this. In a 15-year follow-up, what these authors have found, this is mostly in the critical care literature, that if you use intraoperative goal-directed therapy, although it's not significant, you can see protocol patients who are on goal-directed therapy had a much higher percentage survival rates far out as 15 years after the 28, first 28 day period. So the effects of goal-directed fluid therapy go far beyond the immediate effects in maintaining that path to recovery by minimizing the inflammatory response. And even if the patients have had complications, there is no difference in the survival when the patients have had goal-directed therapy and particularly in reference to cardiovascular morbidity. So goal-directed therapy is not fluid restriction. Obviously, all of us know that we give too little, we have problems. We give too much, all of us know the effects of that. So that's the sweet spot where we aim, and sometimes it can be challenging. I have to admit that. We're still learning on what's the best ways to get there. Pain management, we've talked about the multimodal opioid sparing strategies with, again, to influence the immediate recovery pattern, which is going to help both the intermediate and the long term. So the key is the preoperative, intraoperative pain management strategies, which are going to help us in the postoperative phase. A minute about why are opioids bad? We're, we've been using opioids for a long time. They're still the gold standards of therapy. We know opioids cause all side effects. But most importantly, what we've come to realize now is that about one in seven of all patients have opioid-related adverse events during their hospital stay. And when they have an opioid-related adverse event, it can be as simple as ileus. The length of stay is increased by three days on an average, and the cost of care increased by 25%. In this particular study, when they compared the two groups, Patients who did not have opioid-related complications, their cost of hospitalization was $17,000. Patients who had opioid-related complications, the cost was $22,000. So in this environment of value-based care, that's going to be important. So we have to resort to multimodal opioid steering strategies, as already alluded to. So we have to start the preoperative program we have in place during the intraoperative phase. And here, again, I've showed you some of the things we employ. We use IV dexmeritomidine, ketamine, lidocaine infusions, liposomal bupivacaine, or tap blocks, or epidurals, along with IV, uh, IV estaminophen. What about the postoperative phase? Avoid unnecessary delay in feeding or ambulation. I've changed. I used to have this as early feeding and ambulation. But as Tom has alluded to, if you're having a major surgery, with a high physiological insult. Patients may not progress as fast as some of our routine procedures. So we have to question every day, is this patient able to tolerate feeds and can they move their GI system along? We have to have an active bowel management program, always question the needs for drains and tubes, multimodal pain management strategies. So what are the benefits? Benefits, again, we have to focus on symptom control, reducing non-surgical postoperative complications, accelerate functional recovery. By doing so, we'll reduce length of stay. But we also have to watch on pre-admission rates and how they're doing post-discharge. If you look at quality of life surveys and what are patients' perception of their quality of recovery, the single most thing that comes out is fatigue. And fatigue goes a long way in how they're able to get back to their functional status. But by adopting to these enhanced recovery strategies, it's been shown that not only is early postoperative fatigue reduced, but the severity of that is reduced by these multimodal opioid sparing strategies. There was a meta-analysis which was done which looked at 
all enhanced recovery programs and their benefits for major abdominal surgery. And the conclusion was time has come when we should routinely use these programs or initiatives for major abdominal procedures. And there's an economic benefit as well. In the New Zealand hospital, they looked at the cost of incorporating this program, which was about $104,000, New Zealand dollars, in their system. And the benefits was for each patient, they were able to cut down the cost by $7,000. So go figure the numbers. Now, the programs have become so um, popular in Europe that many of the countries, Holland mainly, Denmark, Spain, and the UK have mandated some sort of enhanced recovery programs in each of the hospitals. And there are government-funded programs to help this. So, as always, change is difficult. There are going to be barriers to implement change. But we have to come up with a system as a team to address what are the concerns and how do we overcome those questions and how do we implement change. It's teamwork, and it's mainly a change in the culture. Now, there are still some unanswered questions and opportunities for research in helping our patients attain their functional recovery. And what are these? So the comprehensive perioperative pathway I've shown earlier has 17 elements. I'm not sure if all 17 have equal weightage on their contribution for enhanced recovery. So we as a group have to come up with a research methodology to see which of those elements are mandatory for patients' recovery to functional status. Then we have to use a methodology where we can identify the system, the symptom burden in the recovery profile so that with that information, then we can target the particular symptoms which are causing uh, hindrance to patient recovery. And then we have to have a definition of recovery. Obviously, a recovery for a hepatic resection is not the same as the Whipple's because of the multitude of 